Welcome everybody to Pinoy Bounce, you know, the show about basketball, everything about basketball, everything about in the Filipino community. My name's PJ, joining me are my co-hosts, Marky Mark right there, and we got Ingrid May right there. We have a special, special guest. Uh, he's not going to be in studio, obviously, it's virtual. Matthew Wright, a PBA professional athlete, one of the Filipino Canadians that have made it to the PBA. I'm so excited because we're going to interview him finally. Mark, what do you want to ask him and are you excited about it? Yeah, I mean, um, one of the reasons why we created Pinoy Balance was to highlight Filipino Canadians. And we've done that totally throughout our season. He's kind of the uh, the holy grail that we've been uh, reaching out to. We've, he's been so busy and, and he's doing his thing. And this is you know a golden opportunity for not just us as uh, the creator of Pinoy Balance, but the kids that we do the show for. So we, we did this for you guys and we hope that you guys, we get to know him the way we want to get to know him, which is not just his professional career, but his life, you know, as a, as a bat, what's his passion besides, you know, what got him into basketball, what got him through uh, the tough times in basketball. And so that's the kind of question we want to ask him. Let me just, you know, read his accomplishments first, and then we'll get him to say hi to all of you. So Matthew Wright, career highlights and awards, ABL champion, 2016. ABL ACN Asian, I guess that's Asian, Heritage Import MVP 2016, two times, two time PBA All Star 2017 2018, two time PBA All Star Game MVP 2017 Mindanao and 2017 Luzon, PBA Mythical Second Team 2018, PBA All Rookie Team 2017, and then the most recently, you know, we could say it's the best. You know, franchise franchise history, right? For Phoenix Fuel Master that just recently happened, you made it all the way to the semifinals. So that is who we have here in the virtual building, Matthew Wright. Everybody, virtual hug. Thank you, thank hey, you, up? thanks for having me, guys. First and foremost, appreciate it, man. All right, so let's get to talking. Like we said, we're gonna we're gonna interview you and get to know you more because you are a not a pioneer. You could say it's a pioneer, but you are almost like almost a legend now. You're in legendary status in the Filipino Canadian community. So let's dive straight into your life. Can we talk about, you know, um, I played, obviously I'm Filipino, I played basketball in the Filipino league. I know I watched you in Lacan, right? Lakin or Lacan, whatever, however people pronounced it. Yeah, Lacan, Lacan. Lacan, bro, Lacan. <laughs> so let's talk about just you growing up in the Filipino league and talk about your mom and just your experience playing in such a, uh, a community league in the beginning. Yeah, you know, it, it was everything, man. That was that was basically my start in basketball. My Tito from Tarlac immigrated here. He would um, he would bring me to his you know Filipino basketball leagues. At the time, it was in North York, and um, you know we were living in a at the time, so it was a little bit of a trek. So he ended up finding a closer one down at Lakeshore, Palapan, and he brought me to the first practice. I met Norbert Torres. That was my first basketball. That was my first teammate. I think we were nine years old, and then. Um, it's crazy how far basketball has brought us all the way to the pros. You came when I, when I got drafted by the, the Phoenix Fuel Masters, he was actually my teammate. So it was, kind of, it was crazy. It was like a full circle moment. He was my first teammate in, in um, MPAA and then he became my first teammate in the pros. So um, it was crazy. And it's just thinking that, you know, both of us growing up in the Filipino community, we played every tournament, Anaba, you know, uh, FIBA, FCAA, like we were in every single league, basically just, you know, trying to trying to compete against other Filipinos for bragging rights. That's all it was at the time. Did you did you know you were among great company? I guess when you were growing up in those Filipino leagues, because you played you played with and your kind of I'll say draft class or your generation, you had great players. You had you know James Forrester. You had all these talents. Did you know and like what did you miss about that community uh, league? I guess. I mean, I grew up you know, studying the game. So I was always watching the older guys. Even at 10, 11 years old, I was watching the senior games, uh, the open games. So I was watching, you know, Mike Samir at the time doing windmills, mm. you know, <laughs> pinning guys with two hands in the backboard. I was watching JP Albano just killing. Like, JP was my favorite growing up, actually. Him and Elvin, uh, aka Jesus. I don't know if you guys know him, but those are two guys that I was looking up to. And obviously, Dean. Um, I was a little too young to see Dean in his prime, but I've heard a lot of stories about him. So, uh, And then obviously John Samir when he was in his prime too. Those guys were like, you know, four, five, six, seven years older than me, but I always wanted to compete with them. And um, I think my secret was even when I was a kid, I was playing against, you know, I was 12, 13, I was playing in the 17, 18 open division. So I think that kind of helped me, um, you know, develop edge, 
uh, develop some kind of toughness because you know how it is. Um, it's really physical in the Filipino league, so it's even more physical in the Philippines. So um, you know you got to be a, you got to be a man of that, and especially as a kid, you want to prove yourself to the older guys. Mm, yeah, that's true. Um, you have a question, Mike. Yeah, mine is just uh, specifically with you, Matt. How did you, when did you kind of realize or find out that, hey, this is something that I could do or play professionally or I could, you know, something that you could be passionate about, not just something that you're doing as a hobby, but something that you could take on on another level. When did this kind of came about with you? Right away, right when I picked up the game, I, I thought like, this is what I want to do. This is it. Like, I had no plan B whatsoever. I put all my eggs in one basket. Uh, you know, I told my mom, like, this is what I want to do. There's nothing else. So um, yeah, I was always that kid growing up. Like, I can't I have practice. I can't go to this. I got practice. Um, I ha- can't go there. I can't go to this party. I have a tournament. So that was just the kind of kid I was growing up. But I didn't mind it because, you know, game of basketball brought me, you know, all around the world. So you know, I can't really complain. But right away, right when I picked it up, I fell in love with it. I know you're also in the, uh, uh, a lot of kids nowadays also want to go play in the Philippines, right? But maybe some of them has, have never seen you play. I mean, I remember watching you, you were pulling up from like half court. I remember in MPA, you were, I don't know like if that was in your game plan, but you were just pulling up from half court. You were doing uh, all these crazy moves. But what was it? Uh, do you have any highlighted moments in the Filipino league that really sticks out? Like in terms of playing or maybe a battle, maybe a game? Um, man, I wish we had Twitter back then, man. These kids would have saw what I was doing. Like, I was doing this shit before Steph Curry and <laughs> not, Dean, not before Steph. Dean but, said yeah, the same like, thing, I, too. I just, <laughs> so. Yeah, man. I, I love doing that. That was one of those game breakers. That was, that was kind of like my go-to move was like the pull-up half-court. Like, not full half-court, but like, uh, yeah, three-point pull-up. But um, probably my biggest memory was my first ever championship in NPAA. I was 10 years old. It was year 2000. And that was my first year playing organized basketball. We ended up playing North York in the finals. We beat them. And I, I, I had the, me and Carlo Agamino were uh, the finals MVPs. And that was the first time I was like, man, like, this, this sport's pretty easy. Like, this is my first time playing. And, you know, we want to chip. And obviously, I didn't know at the time how good our team was compared to everyone else. You know, we had Norbert and other guys by the time. So, and then the league started to get better. You know, I remember CJ, his hit came in. Um, guys like Norman, uh, Guillen, uh, uh, Christian, uh, Christian Epistola, uh, Chris Archangel. There's a bunch of guys that came out and um, it started becoming a lot more competitive. And, um, you know, teams like North York Falcons, Vaughn, they started getting better. So the competition got better and got more exciting. So uh, can you talk about uh, moving on to uh, after high school because you went to uh, – you know, Martin Grove, right? But a lot of kids, it's always the next step, right? They want to play Division One, And you play Division One, right? A lot of kids, like, a lot of kids have dreams that they want to play in the NBA, that maybe um, your, the Titos are like, go play PBA. But it's all, it's hard. Uh, like, talk about the jump in level. So let's talk about you jumping into, like, high school and then jumping into uh, Division One. Well, high school, I mean, uh, high school is pretty easy, to be honest. <laughs> pretty easy. Um, yeah, but um, it really got challenging my first couple of practices in the States because you're playing against, um, you know, every guy on that team is an alpha male. Every single one of the guys on the team was the best player in, in their city, in their region, in their, in their high school. So you have a, a bunch of, you know, 14, 15 guys, all ages, 18 to 22, hungry for, you know, to make it to the NBA. They want to kill you every practice, even though they're teammates. It was a dog eat dog world in Division One, man. It's no joke. And, you know, there's fights and, you know, you're in a hot ass gym in the summertime training every day. So, you know, you're battling guys in the same position as you, um, you know, guys who are rated higher on ESPN than you. But it's just really a doggy dog world, man. It really it really made me tough and it, it really, um, you know, exposed the things that I needed to work on. And then once the game started to go, um, you know, you, you just picked up you, you kind of just um, I don't know what the word is, but. Uh, you see the talent, the level of commitment that everyone else has on the team. So you have to like basically rise up to that level, um, you know, to meet that standard. And, and that was an exciting jump for me, for sure. And, um, you know, we had a very successful team. I was with Andrew Nicholson. I'm sure you guys know him. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of probably the best basketball player to come out of Saga. And, um, yeah, we made a good run. And, um, yeah, it was a big jump, though. It was a big jump in terms of just physical plus, you know, the physicality over there. 
I don't think I ever lifted a weight at all. <laughs> it's like, I was like 165 pounds, if you guys remember. And then I, you know, I go to D1 and these guys are like, you know, benching 350. And so that was one of the things I had to really, that was the biggest difference in my opinion was the, the change in my body and, and how athletic and how fast these guys were. Um, Matt, before your uh, transition, uh, I guess before your transition to the Philippines, what are some of the things that you uh, took in, some of the things you prepare yourself in mentally, physically, uh, maybe some of the people that you reached out to for advice or how to prepare yourself before you actually went to the Philippines? I asked a lot of questions to a lot of guys who, um, who experienced the same things like AJ Mandani, James Forrester, uh, you know, like I said, JP Albano, those guys went to the Philippines. So they're able to give me like, you know, a little precursor for what to expect, especially James, because he got drafted. He was the first Canadian to actually get drafted, you know, top three by you know, Hinebra. So he really showed me the ins and outs, what not to do, you know, who to suck up to. <laughs> you know, things, things of that things of that nature that he that no one taught him. So he taught me and I was able to, you know, retain that information and and use it to the best of my advantage and I was able to carve out a, a pretty good career so far. And it, it wouldn't, honestly, it wouldn't be without, um, you know, talent and work, hard work and all that shit goes out the window. Cause you know, sometimes it's, it's about, you know, connections and, and, and how you, per, how you get along personally with people. So they gave me the heads up on who to really watch out for and who to, you know, there's, there's certain people in the league that you know, it's, it's all, it's a lot of it's politics too, but there's people that you got to respect and um, you know, they made a name for themselves. So, uh, yeah, you're just trying to get, you know, on their good side. So um, the, those guys, the ones I mentioned, helped me uh, big time. And also just mentally preparing yourself, um, not being able to see your family for an extended period of time because the PBA is the longest. It's, it, there's no break. It's, it's basketball nonstop. It's three conferences all year round. So um, I barely get time to go home. So you have to really mentally prepare yourself to, uh, you know, be by yourself or to, to be away from your loved ones. Um, one of our question, another questions for um, the challenges that you've gone through as you know as a Filipino Canadian going into, you know, into the Division One or going into like the states and everything to play for basketball. What were the extra steps that you've had to take, and what kind of advice would you give, you know, for the youth, you know, Filipino Canadians that want to play basketball in, in Division One? When I was growing up, it was like taboo. Like, if, like not a lot of Canadians went Division One at the time, so like you really had to work your ass off to get noticed and to get any kind of scholarship. You had to send tape out by yourself, like physically send tape, and mail it to schools. I was in that era. So um, it's a lot easier for kids now to get exposure and to, to send out their high, their highlight tapes. But um, if I were to give one advice, it's just tr truly believe in yourself like and have all the utmost confidence in yourself because it's, it's your world, man. Like, um, you know, you know, don't try to get caught up on the next person. Um, just invest fully in yourself. Be, believe in yourself. And because, um, you know, if you don't believe in yourself, then nobody will. And, um, you know, there's going to be a dime a dozen players who are just as good as you, just as athletic as you. But the, the, the difference maker between those, you and the other person is, you know, how much confidence you have in yourself and, you know, how bad you want it. So, um, you know, I, I just want all the Canadian Filipinos out there to know that, you um, you know, I was just like one of you guys growing up, not knowing if I was good enough, um, you know, to play outside of a Philippine dominant basketball league. But, you know, if you believe in yourself, you work hard, you do the research, you, you put, you know, you you watch the greats and, um, you know, you'll be able to, to flourish in any league. Uh, I want to touch upon that belief in yourself. I know the Philippines call you the Filipino Canadian sniper. Right, <laughs> they call you the sniper, Papacino. But um, I, I watched or I listened to a podcast, uh, Eric. Right, and you mentioned that in between, before you went to the Philippines, you actually you were at your lowest point where you worked as a, at a warehouse, and you almost yeah. you know you got cut from France, and now you had no money, no salary. You actually had to work in a warehouse to provide for your family. Can you talk about that pain and like motivation and, you know, kids, you know, they say ball is life, ball is life. But when shit hits the fan, like, I just want to know uh, when you're in, in your shoes, what uh, talk about the pain and like the motivation and that, your mindset and, at that time. So going back to your humble beginnings again. <laughs> yeah, those are some dark times, man. Um, 
I grew up on East Mall um, in, in, um, in Etobicoke, so it's a pretty rough neighborhood. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. Um, you know, I, at that time, I was just, I, I just had a, uh, my first son, Preston, right out of college. So I really needed work. I really needed money, any which way I can support him. So, um, you know, I was thinking, okay, well, I had a great year. I had a great senior year of college. Hopefully I'll be able to get some looks. Maybe I'll get some NBA invites to try out for some D league teams and whatnot. And worst case scenario, I'll just go over to Europe, but I didn't realize how competitive it is. I didn't realize how cutthroat the business, the, the professional basketball game is like, um, I had an agent who him and I didn't really get along and, you know, I feel like he ris- misrepresented me, didn't really put me in positions to succeed. But when I finally did get the chance to go to France, um, which was getting paid, I was getting paid double the amount that I would have if I signed with the, with the main red clause of the Boston Celtics D league team, which I tried out for, um, at the time they weren't offering anything at all. I was going to be like the third string shooting guard taking the bride in the bus in D league. So, um, I decided to go over to France. They're offering a lot more money. So not even that much money that I think about it. Um, but at the time I was like, hell yeah, like I, I need, I just need whatever I can get right now. So I had a one year old on the way, went over to France, had a pretty good couple of games. And then we had a change of coach, uh, coaching staff and the uh, management kind of took a different route in terms of our team, in terms of our game plan. And, you know, me and the coach got into it, one one practice, one game. And, um, you know, I, I guess this, the French, is, I guess, are a lot more sensitive and, and a lot less tolerant to, to talking back than, oh, damn. Than, most, <laughs> than most people are, right? So I guess it's one of those culture things that I should have known going in. You know, I can't be acting and going the same way that I have been my whole life and expect it to be this, the exact same in another country, you know what I mean? So uh, that was my bad on that point. And ever since our, our relationship soured, he stopped playing me. I eventually got cut and I had to go back home before I even, this is before I even signed to France. I had to actually work in a warehouse, like you mentioned, up in Rexdale, Rexdale and Martin Grove, just packing boxes just to get some kind of money in between college and my first pro job. Because You were boxing like, out, bro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally, literally boxing out. Literally one. boxing out. <laughs> so, yeah, man, I was taking the Martin Grove bus up to, up to Rexdale, just you know, putting my, my head down, <laughs> wearing some Tims and some khakis and just, just flipping boxes and, and stacking boxes in the trucks, you know, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And, and well, you know, while I was thinking that I was, I was thinking to myself, like this, this, you know, it's not the life that I expected to live, but, um, you know, this, this is what you got to do. Just play like plain and simple. This, this is the, this is the test. I, I told myself, this is all the test. How badly do I want it? And, um, you know, obviously, I'm lucky that everything ended up working out well. So, um, but yeah, those are very humbling times there because, uh, you know, it really gave me an appreciation. Um, I was able to really appreciate my time in Malaysia and the Philippines because of the time I spent in France and before that working in a, in a factory. Um, it really made me, it really showed me what life could be, um, you know, for, for someone who's less fortunate. And so ever, ever since that, you know, I've always been um, on a different level in terms of gratitude. Good. And now six years of professional ball. That's that's it's a long time. Six years, you know. No, like, it's like, crazy how looking fast back it. at it, when you were in the warehouse, did you envision it? Were you thinking about play? Like, did you at know? your lowest point? Like, yeah, did you see? Point, did you think? <laughs> did you see yourself becoming a PBA player? Like in that warehouse point. when you were yeah. bouncing out. <laughs> I knew I was I was still shooting garbage into into the barrels there. I'm telling these guys, bro. <laughs> trust me, trust. I was telling all of my Jamaican friends. I was just working with a bunch of Jamaican guys. I was telling them, you know, trust me, man. Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play pro. <laughs> these guys all thinking like, this guy is you know, this guy is just a you know nobody. Like, you know, <laughs> this guy talking. These guys working in the factory with us talking about he's gonna be a professional basketball player one day. No, they probably no. thought I was crazy. That's <laughs> crazy, bro. That's crazy. Oh, Matt, for you um, on your turn. In the, when you first landed in the Philippines, like what was your, what was your envision? Like what did you picture Philippines would be like, and what what was it actually like when you got there and and you actually experienced the like, lifestyle and culture in there? Was it a I culture mean, shock? Yeah. No, not at all. People get okay. it twisted. They think because I'm half white, like you know, I'm, I go to the Philippines and I'm like, ah, oh, ew, it's too dirty. But like, yeah. oh, man, I've I've. I hit the ground running, man. I felt right at home, man. Like <laughs> I was just wearing, I was just wearing, you know, san, sando and, and boxes all day. With the <laughs> like, that's, 
it, so that was perfect it, for me. It didn't so. surprise you that they don't have toilet paper in like the mall and they had to <laughs> bring I, you before I actually signed to play in the PBA, I already went to the Philippines like three times. So like when I was one, when I was five, and when I was 17. So I've been there, you know, I've done the whole tabo, you know, <laughs> take a shit and use a tabo. I've, I've done that whole thing already, man. Like nothing else. I, I showered outside in a, in a hose in the province. I did every, I did everything, man. J- mm. Rode a jeepney. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk about your career now. Um, like playing in the Philippines. You played for the national team before you played for. Um, uh, Phoenix, right? Could you talk about playing for your for your, for your country? Like, obviously, uh, basketball is such a big, you know, it's almost a religion. People say it's a cultural thing, but how was it to play for Gilas? You know, did you know about Gilas and like, uh, how was it? The tr- their training and everything about them. I don't think people realize how basketball crazy Filipinos are. Like, I'm. Sh- I, mean, I know you guys know being Filipino, but when you actually go home and converse with you know the locals there and when you actually go to a game that's nowhere near the philippines and the entire crowd in lebanon is all filipino you know and then you hear them singing the the national anthem at the top of their lungs like you get crazy goosebumps like i can't even explain that that moment the national anthem when everyone's in tune singing and um you know you just get you just feel the hair rise all over your body and just feel a, a, a different sense of, of pride. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, the, the country just stops what they're doing to support, to critique sometimes. Um, you know, the fan love, the, the love from the fans is crazy. It's amazing. Um, but, they, you know, it could, also be ve- it could also be very, very critical of your game. So it's, it's kind of, you know, like a double-edged sword. But it's just coming from pure passion. They just love it so much. And um, especially this year, this, the country went through a lot with the pandemic and the floods and the hurricanes. So it's almost like basketball is all we had. Can you can you bring us back to um, your draft night? Uh, was your mom with you? Who, who were you with? Where did you get the news? Because that was the point where you turned into a PBA athlete, right? So just walk us through draft night because I'm sure a lot of Filip- Filipino Canadians won't experience that. James Forster, obviously, but um, just PBA draft night yeah. in general. And where were you in? Sorry. Yeah, uh, draft night was a crazy experience. I already knew where I was going to go before draft night, though. So that was the only thing. I kind of I kind of wanted the entire, um, you know, not knowing where you're going to sign and just that that like nervousness of, you know, who's, which team's going to pick you. You know, I feel like that's all part of the experience, but unfortunately to say, I already knew what team I was going for like two days before. So that took a little bit of the joy, but I, at least I knew I was going to get drafted. So I think I went second overall that year. Technically um, there was, it was a weird draft. It was like a special draft with different rules. So it was a little different than, than most, but um, I felt stupid kind of because I was the only one who dressed up. Everyone was just wearing like a barong and like I wore a turtleneck with a blazer and everyone was looking at me crazy. So. You had the NBA uh, GQ style watching too much yeah, tunnel yeah. videos. Yeah, I mean, I, you guys probably pull it up one of, the, one of the pictures, but I flew my mom out um, a week before that because I knew how much this meant to her. She's always wanted me to go back home to the Philippines and um, I wasn't really planning on going back to the PBA until I was like 31, 32, I wanted to play in Europe still and um, wherever else because I knew the PBA would accept me no matter what. And, um, but, you know, when mom, when mom and grandma tell you to do something, you go do um, it. <laughs> you gotta go, you gotta go do it. So, uh, yeah, they, they really encouraged me to go to, you know, go back home and, um, you know, help the family back home too. Can you talk about, um, uh, now, now you're a professional, your rookie year and, um, I guess you're now getting scouted, right? People are getting game plans. Maybe you're scoring points on teams that, you know, they're, they're, they don't like that, right? You're scoring on them a lot. Who's this Phil Foran guy uh, that's a uh, Canadian guy that's scoring like 20 on us? Like, can you talk about the scouting of your game and uh, maybe some criticisms that people have brought? At first, I came in as strictly just a shooter. That's what the scouting report was. So teams are just trying to run me off the line. Um, you know, going there, no one was going under screens anymore. Everyone was just trailing me and teams are really trying to rough me up and be physical. And, um, that's one thing I had to adjust in the PBA is that it's an extremely physical league and, you know, borderline dirty. And, um, you can basically see how much, 
uh, the Philippine bat, like how when you see the super seniors and the Titos, when you see how they play, you know where it's coming from. And like when you go back to the motherland, these guys are throwing elbows and knees and these guys are getting, I got punched in my stomach like three or four times in a row. Oh my God. Um, you know, my okay. first game, yeah, the referee's just not, you know, pretending like they don't see it. So teams are really trying to rough me up first to, um, you know, get me rattled, I guess. You know, they thought that it might affect me somehow, so. Uh, when when you were at uh, the league, who were some of the people that, that kind of took you under their wing and kind of showed you the ways in the PBA and that helped you in your journey? Um, Willie Wilson. He's, uh, I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's a, a LaSalle legend. Um, he was, he's an 18 or 17 year pro in the PBA. He was my teammate on Phoenix. He really helped me, took me under his wing and, um, showed me the ropes and, um, you know, showed me how to behave and how to act as a, as a professional, not just a professional, but, uh, a professional who, um, is going to be under the spotlight. So there's a different way that you have to react and how you have to carry yourself, especially in public. So, um, he definitely took me under his wing big time. That ends the first part of the interview with Matthew Wright. Um, it was a great time with him. There's more to come, so make sure you check out part two. Anything you'd like to say before we end the, uh, this part one? Um, well, Matthew is uh, <laughs> one of the kind of those gems, but like his personality, just to get to know him. I hope you guys can see really how genuine he is with his beginnings and, and what, how passionate he is about basketball and to believe in himself right from the get-go. He, he said he didn't have any options. That's... It was That's all insane. eggs in the basket, yeah. right? So most people don't bet like that. Most people usually give you a um, plan A and a plan B just in case. But, but he had no plan B, so we gotta give him that. Give him props for that too. That's right. And you should have no plan B as well, because come back and watch part two. Okay, part one and part two. <laughs>